flyers. Um, this isn't fake. We sincerely care about people, and we want to see Hagerstown freed of opioid addictions. We want to see Martinsburg free of opioid addictions. We want to see Chambersburg free. We want to see Mercersburg free. We want to see Frederick free. We're believing that God is going to use us to spread hope to the world. But before we spread hope to the world, I got to spread hope to you. So my job today is to give you some hope. If you look on uh, these flyers, you can know what the sermon is going to be this week and the next two weeks. It says, find hope, embrace community, and discover purpose. So today we're talking about finding hope. I want to open up with John chapter 10 that it's a very, very famous passage of Scripture that most of us have heard before. Unfortunately, this Scripture a lot of times has been so many times rehearsed and said that it becomes more of a cliche than a reality. We say it, but I wonder if we're living it, if we're walking in it. Simply put, it says the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But then Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. That you may have life. And that you may have life more abundantly. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. The truth is, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, a native of America, if you came here as an immigrant. I'll go a step further and say it doesn't matter if you are legally here or illegally here. It doesn't matter how much money's in your bank account. How many people you know, what your job is, or if you have debt or no debt. One thing stands true for all mankind, both male and female. The enemy wants you to suffer. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your innocence. He wants to steal your hope. He wants you to live broken with the end goal of destroying you. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy all people. We can sit back and talk about systematic racism and is it real and we can talk about political parties and what agenda one has versus the other and why they're the better candidate and is racism an issue. We can talk about that, but at the end of the day, white or black, rich or poor, Asian, African, Hispanic descent, it is not relevant. The enemy wants us all to suffer, to be divided, and the end result to be destroyed. And many of us today are busy on the hamster wheel of life, running as fast as we can, trying to accomplish, but we look at our lives and we're exhausted. We're overwhelmed. We're overworked probably underpaid. Un we're not appreciated. People aren't aware of what we do and what we put in, and we ask ourselves, why? Why do I do what I do? Does it even matter? Does anyone know? And the enemy wants us to become so overwhelmed with life and all that it brings, the struggles, 
that we simply say, heck with it, I'm done. I want to talk to you today and tell you in the midst of you being overwhelmed and just feeling like you're on the brinks of a mental breakdown, in the midst of your body falling apart and you begin to limp more and more each day and struggle more and more each day, in the midst of all of that, God's word is still true. God was the same yesterday when you were 15. He's the same today when you are 50, 60, or 70, and he'll be the same forevermore. God does not change. He's not a man that he should lie. And he's not the son of man that he needs to repent. Everything he spoke is still true. But you say, it doesn't feel like it. I feel like he's stealing because he is. I feel like he's killing because he is. And I feel like I'm about to be destroyed. He will if you don't get the second part of what Jesus came to do. The Bible says, cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. Jesus was cursed for you that you could walk in the blessings of him. Everything that you deserve, he took that now you can have life and life more abundantly. Your family doesn't need to struggle. You don't need to barely get by. Can I tell you that God wants to bless you and he wants to bless you abundantly. The title of the message is Hope, the Fight of Your Life. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And we are in a fight, a fight for hope. And we must remember that Jesus has come to give us life. He's come to give us hope. And not only to give us life and to give us hope, but he came to give us both of those more abundantly. We cannot forget that God is in control and his desire is to bless you. God's not angry at you. He wants to bless you. We say karma. Bible says you reap what you sow. But can I tell you that yes, you reap what you sow. Yes, there's karma or, or there's consequences to what you've done. But here's the good thing about God. He's not the dysfunctional partner that always holds you accountable for what you did in the past. When you say, I'm sorry and you turn to him, he doesn't hold what you did to him against you. And you are freed from your karma, and you can walk in his blessings. He gives you a new deck of cards. He gives you a new hand because he's the dealer. We cannot forget that God is in control and he wants to bless us. I know our world is crazy, and I know, quite frankly, a lot of y'all's situations are crazy. I know I pastor some crazy people. That's why some of y'all come here. You're like, I just love it. My pastor know I'm crazy. So I already know it. I know you're crazy. And even though you're crazy and even though you failed God, there's still hope for you. Even though I'm crazy and I failed God, guess what? There's still hope for me. There's hope beyond my mistakes. And there's hope beyond yours. If life is difficult for you right now today, here's the good news. There's hope for you beyond your situation that you are in right now. Today, I would like to talk to you about hope, especially when you're trying to come out of a difficult season. Maybe you had a pregnancy and you weren't expecting it. Maybe you lost someone that you didn't expect to lose. Maybe a job is about to go out of business, and now you got to find a new place to work. Maybe the one that you thought that would be there forever has stabbed you in the back. I don't know what your situation is, but what I'm telling you is that there's hope beyond whatever you're in 
today. People may come along and tell you that you're not good enough. They may tell you that you're not capable. They may tell you you're too young. Or they may remind you of what you previously have done. But it doesn't matter what people say. All that matters is what God says. And if we want to find hope today, you're not going to find it from your, your homeboys and your girlfriends and other folks who might be critical. You're going to find hope today when you start listening to God and seeing yourself differently and seeing your situation differently. We can't keep viewing ourselves through the mistakes of our past. We can't keep focusing on the troubles that are in our life today. If we want to find hope, we need to stop seeing our situation through a toxic lens. Let me say that again. If we want to find hope today, we need to start seeing our life through a toxic lens. We have to stop seeing our life through a toxic lens. A toxic lens will only keep you in despair. We have to start seeing our situation through God's lens, through God's perspective. What's important is not what others think about me. What's important is what God thinks about me. We have to stop allowing people who are negative to be how I view my own life. Conspiracy theorists many times have caused me to stop dreaming and to start living in fear. Critics have caused me to focus on what I've done wrong where God wants me to focus on what he has done right. See, the problem isn't people believing in me. The problem is when I don't believe in myself. I don't need Excuse me, but I don't need you to be successful. And quite frankly, you don't need me to be successful. The only thing I need is to understand who God is and who I am in Christ. We need to get to a place that we can see ourselves the way God sees us, even if no one else sees any potential in us. I can tell you, when I was 21 years old, made some awful mistakes, and at the age of 20, I found myself somewhere that I would not like to be. And I remember meeting with a drug and alcohol counselor. She was a doctor. She had her, her PhD, and, and I was ordered to take these classes. And as a 20-year-old young man, 21-year-old young man, and a 22-year-old young man, here's what she told me. You'll always be like this. Statistics show 80-plus percent always return to this lifestyle. This is who you were, and this is who you'll continue to be. And I made a decision that day that I would prove her wrong. Can you imagine if I kept viewing my life through her lens? Today I'm 43 years old, and I still haven't returned to what she said I'd return to. See, it's important what lens you're looking through. It's important who you allow to dictate what you see. Because if you see negative, your life will be negative. You want to be successful? I say this all the time. If you want to have a life of success, you need to be successful each year. But if you want to be successful each year, you need to be successful each month. If you want to be successful each month, you need to be successful each week. And if I want to be successful each week, I need to be successful each day. And who I am each day determines what I become. 
And what I am each day depends on how I see life. And if we don't decide to see life through God's lens, the devil will make it a point that you see life through his. He wants you dead. He wants you destroyed. And if you believe God, you can succeed, even if others don't believe in you. What's most important is not what others think about you. What's most important is what you think about yourself. I often share this scripture. I love it. It's in Matthew 6 and 23, and well, 22 and 23. You can see it behind me. It says, the lamp of the body is the eye. A lamp creates light. And this is saying that the eye being the lamp is what illuminates my body. It says, if therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Depending on how I see depends on what's inside of me. Let me say that again. Depending on how I see is what dictates what's inside of me. If I see my life as dark and broken, I will be dark and broken. But if I realize who I am in Christ and I begin to look at life differently, there's a light that'll go on. This scripture is talking about the importance of how we see things. Oftentimes, the outcome is based off of our perception. This is why the same two people can have the same life of struggle, but one makes it and the other doesn't. A victim never makes it, but a victor does. A victim doesn't make it because they look through the lens of despair. But when you look through the lens of optimism... When you look through the lens of faith, when you look through the lens of who God is and who you are in him, there's no chance for us to be living in depression and, and, and wallowing in our own mess because we see the victory. We need to view ourselves and view our situations the same way God does. For some of you, life is beating you up. Can I get an amen? Anybody here? Better stated than beating you up. For some of y'all, life has beat you down. I bet many here today can say life has been hard. It's been challenging. We must take a stand and say we are more than what our circumstance looks like. And I will rise above it. So you're saying, Pastor, how do I do that? The first thing you need to do is you need to pray, God, open my eyes. I need some new glasses. I, I need some new lenses. Right? You, need to, you need to see things differently. In 2 Kings chapter 6, thinking about new eyes, I think about the story of Elisha and how there was an army coming against Elisha. And Elisha says, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those that are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray that you'll open my servant's eyes. Then the Lord opened his eyes and the young man was able to see. If you go and read this story in its entirety, what we see is that there was an enemy pursuing Elisha. And Elisha had someone there with him, and this was the young man, a servant. It was his mentee. And the mentee said, Elisha, why aren't you scared? The enemy's coming after us. They want to steal, kill, and destroy us. And he's overwhelmed with anxiety and fear because 
he sees the enemy. But then Elisha said to him, yeah, but while you see the enemy coming after you, we've got an ally, an ally who's standing with us. And he said, Lord, I pray that you will open his eyes that he can see. He was already following the man of God. This tells me he was already in church. What's that mean? What it means is we all run the risk of being in church but still seeing unhealthy. Just because you're in the presence of the man of God don't mean you have the eyes of God. Does anybody get that? And, 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 and the point that I'm making is we've got to say, Lord, I need you to open my eyes because I'm seeing the enemy, cancer. I'm seeing the enemy, diabetes. I'm seeing the enemy, betrayal. I'm seeing the enemy, my children are far from God. I'm seeing the enemy, political unrest. What's your enemy today? What happens is the enemy becomes so big that we almost can't see our ally. And while Elisha saw the ally, the servant couldn't. What this tells me is even though we're all here together in the same room serving the same God and many of us dealing with the same enemy, some of us are able to see God in it. And others are struggling with depression and they just cannot get through it because the enemy is so much louder and seemingly bitter, bigger and we need God to open our eyes. I'm not here to tell you that there's not going to be problems in your life, but what I am here to tell you is that God will get you out of it, but can you see him in the midst of it? <laughs> Psalms 138 and 8, the psalmist says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. Y'all hear that? Though I walk in the midst of trouble. This is exactly what's happening with Elisha. They are pursuing him. And, and even though Elisha is in the midst of trouble, he's able to still see God. And I want to ask you a question. While you're in the middle of your struggle, can you still see God? Can you? Because the enemy wants us to be plagued with pest pessimistic concepts and vision and ideas. He wants us to be so overwhelmed and plagued with negative thoughts that we cannot see God. We lose sleep at night. We're not eating well. We isolate and disconnect because we don't feel like being around people. We find ourselves unmotivated to do anything. If this is you, you need to ask God to open your eyes. See, because when your eyes are open and you see like him, you desire to wake up in the morning. When you, when you ask God to give you his eyes, joy comes back into your life. And you're conscious again of life. Here the psalmist, David, says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. Can I tell you today, even if you're in the midst of trouble, if you can fix your eyes on Jesus, he will revive you. This same author of Psalms 138 also wrote Psalms 23 where it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He goes on, he makes me lay down in green pastures. He lies, uh, leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All of that is beautiful. But then he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Though I'm in a valley, the valley's not a good place. It's dark. It's lonely. It's isolation. 
You're not up top on the mountain, but you're down in the valley. In the valley, it's dangerous. There's animals there that can hide very well and get you while you're vulnerable and weak. We all go through the valley from time to time. But the psalmist says, Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why won't you fear? Because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What he's saying is that God, even though I'm struggling, God is with me. Can I tell you today, church family, that God is absolutely with you, and though you walk in the midst of trouble, he will revive you. He wants you to live and not die. He wants you to be sober and not addicted. He wants you to have joy and not misery. He wants you to laugh and not weep. He wants you to have friends and not foes. I want you to understand something today. The Bible declares that we are blessed when we follow him. Blessed. How about we pray, Lord, open my eyes. I know it's hard, I'm overwhelmed, but open my eyes. While I'm in the middle of trouble, God, help me to see you, because I know you still love me. But many times we're in the midst of trouble, and we start doubting God's love for us. Why am I in the valley? God must not love me if I'm in the valley. Man, wonder what I did wrong. I must have done something wrong since I'm in the midst of trouble. Look, can, can I say that we should never measure God's love for us based off our situation? It's seasons. Seasons change. If everything was a high, how would you ever learn? You don't learn from a party. You learn at a funeral. You don't come to God when you're healthy. You come when you're sick. You don't learn to save when you got all the money you want. You learn to save when you've experienced poverty. Does anybody understand what I'm saying today? I'm saying this because God doesn't allow us to go through valleys and troubles because he hates us. It's because he's trying to teach us and prepare us. He loves us, and somebody here today is feeling like I'm in a valley. What did I do wrong? Or you might say, man, I'm in the middle of trouble. Does God really love me? And I want you to know, whoever that is, that Romans 8 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is nobody. For I am persuaded that Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what can separate you from God's love? Nothing. So what do I got to do? It's easy. God, forgive me for not seeing clearly. But help me to see you in everything that I'm in. God, I, I pray that my eyes will open because I'm tired of seeing life through my mom's eyes. Come on, some of y'all need some new world views. You need some new filters. You need some new lenses. Time to stop thinking like your daddy. Time to stop thinking like your granny. Stop, time to stop thinking like that toxic relationship that you were in. Look, it's time to move out of that and say, I refuse to be toxic anymore. I will view life through the word of God, and I will overcome. I will walk in greatness. I will succeed because greater is he that is in me 
that he that is in the world, and he does love me despite my addiction. He does love me despite my priorities got out of whack. He does love me despite I failed as a father. He does love me despite you failed as a mother or a wife. He does love me in spite of whatever I did wrong. And while I'm in the valley, if I change my view, God's going to show up and revive me. So, Lord, I want to see you right now. I want to see my whole life differently because however I am on the inside is going to be how I walk on the outside. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So, so we got to begin to be more optimistic, be, believe God. How many believes God? Come on, it's like that believes he is a great God, that he's great. How many of y'all believe that God wants to bless you? He wants to bless you. He want, Look, God wants every single follower of his to be prosperous. Not a millionaire, prosperous. The Bible says that God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Jesus himself said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. And then psalmist says that our God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, that he owns everything. This tells us that his resources are limitless, and he wants to provide for us. We just got to see our situations differently. Oh, I love Ephesians 3 and 20, where God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. Above all, we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Look at that. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. Above all, you ask or think. Whatever you're asking and thinking and seeing, God can exceed that. God can exceed that. God can exceed whatever you can see. Whatever you see, God can exceed it. So for me, if I'm seeing small, I guess I'm going to reap small. But if I'm seeing big and he's going to exceed it by giving me bigger, then that means I'm going to get even more than what I see and believe. Many of us are convinced that we'll never be happy. Many Christians believe that they will always be in a miserable relationship, that their spouse will never get saved, that they'll never change. Many people believe that this is the cards they've been dealt and it'll never get better. Can I tell you, that is a lie from the pits of hell. Jesus did not die for you to stay in bondage. He died that you can be forgiven, and then he resurrected that you can too. God wants you to resurrect and live a new life, a full one. But the choice is ultimately ours. It's ours. I began to think how I wanted to close this message. And what came to mind was Numbers chapter 13. This is the story when God made a promise to the people of Israel. And he told them, he says, hey, I'm going to bless you. I mean, matter of fact, this same promise was being told for thousands of years. In roughly 2200 B.C., Abraham shows up. And God tells Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And through you, all nations will be blessed. And then after Abraham in 2200 B.C., then comes Moses in 1400 B.C. And God tells Moses, who is a grandson or great-great-grandson, you know, in the family line somehow to Abraham, he tells Moses, he says, hey, I just want to tell you the same thing I told Abraham. He says, I'm going to bless you, and everyone in your line will be blessed. Then after Moses, there was Joshua. 
And God tells Joshua in 1350 B.C., I'm going to bless you. So for hundreds and thousands of years, God's been saying the same thing. I'm going to bless you. And I just want to stop real, real quick and say this. God loves to bless his children. I, I need you to, God loves to bless his children. I don't think there's a parent in this room that doesn't want to see their children blessed. You'd give them anything you have. You love them, and you just want to see them happy. You want to see them living in purpose. You want to see them have enough and even more. And God is saying the same thing. He says, I'm a heavenly father, and I want to see you blessed. I love you. I don't want you to struggle. I want to see you happy. God wants you blessed and full and running over. And we come to the part of the story where Moses, in 1400 B.C., right before he transitions to giving it to Joshua to be the new leader. And Moses says, this is our time. It's our time to cross over this sea, to go cross over the Jordan, and go into the land of Canaan and take our land. God told us the land is ours. It's time to go. They went and they spied out the land. Twelve people went. Twelve spies. And they came back from spying out the land that God said was theirs. And they became fearful. They were scared. They were scared and they were fearful because they were looking through the long, wrong lens. Their perspective was off. And it says in verse 30 that Caleb quieted the people before Moses because the 12 spies came back, and of the 12, two of them had a positive report. And this is normal. Okay, so you got two of 12. That's less than 10%. That means less, I don't know, 8%. 8% of the people had a positive report. 8% saw God, and the 92% saw negativity. And I'm about to be honest with you, those numbers are probably pretty accurate still today. Most people in church are more negative than positive, more pessimistic than optimistic. They see the glass half empty as opposed to half full. And, and we get overwhelmed, including myself, by things that happen. And we begin to regress and second guess our destiny. And God had been telling them, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. And the 12 spies are like, man, we're going into the land. We're going to be blessed. We're going to be blessed. And they crossed over, and they saw it, and they're like, uh-oh, it's not what I thought it would look like. It looks different. It looks good, but it looks harder. I don't know if we can take this land. And they go back, all 12 of them, and Joshua and Caleb said, man, it's good. We got it. We can win. God gave us victory. The land looks awesome. Yeah, the people are good, but our, are big, but our God is bigger. Let's go take our land. We got this, right? And they're all happy and encouraged and excited, and, and, and they're believing God for greatness. And then everybody else is like, oh, no, we can't do that. The other 10 is like, we can't do it. There's no way we can beat them. You should have saw them. They were bigger than us. They were stronger than us. Oh, there's no way we can win this war. And they became a victim. When you're a victim, you don't see victory. God wants us to be victors, not victims. This is why it bothers me when I hear people always pulling the female card, the black card, the poor card. The reality is, is we can make it if we want to. We just got to make a decision that I won't be a victim anymore and I will overcome. Yes, I may be starting further behind. Yes, I may have more opposition. Yes, there might be less people who believe in me. But the Bible says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I can make it. 
We've got to make a decision that we won't be victims how we see life anymore. I will overcome. But unfortunately, the victims won that day. The victims were louder. They always are. The negative report is always louder. The, the negative report is always the majority. It's always easier to find people to get on your side that's negative. And Caleb tried to quiet the people before Moses. And he said, let us go up at once and take possession. I'm not telling you getting what you want out of life is going to be easy. Sometimes you got to take it by force. I'm not saying take it with no integrity. I'm not telling you to steal and be untruthful and, and to receive dishonest gain. But what I'm saying is walking in victory is not for the wimps. Leaders and CEOs and people who walk in greatness and become something great, they're willing to cut off friends that aren't good for them. They're willing to say no when they need to say no. They're willing to save when they don't want to save. They're willing to look poor and drive a hoopty instead of buying a new car. I want someone to get this. When you're wanting something to change, you can't be a wimp. You take possession. He says, we are able to overcome it. Notice it says, overcome it. Caleb didn't say it was going to be easy. He didn't say, it's like, here's what we think. All right, God promises great things over there, right? And we're like, oh, okay, cool. Greatness is coming. Huh, we just skip in it. <laughs> right? That's not how it works. The enemy is the, he, look, he hates you. He doesn't want you to get to freedom. He doesn't want you to get the breakthrough. He doesn't want you to live in overflow. And the moment you cross over and you begin to see blessings, it's going to be met mostly with opposition. Because he wants to discourage you. That you will turn around and go back to comfort. And that's what they said. They said, why don't we just go back to Egypt where we were slaves? At least there we had good food. And many of us are so scared of the unknown that we return to what we know. But Caleb understood something, and that is God promised to bless them. But blessings don't always come easy. Blessings sometimes come with betrayal, heartache, and pain. Sometimes you got to fight, and as it says, you got to take possession. We have to overcome. I'm talking to my overcomers today. But the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go against these people. I know God says that that land is ours, but they're stronger than us. And all the people whom we saw, they're men of great stature. They're big. They're Goliaths. There is no way we stand a chance. They're giants. And we are like grasshoppers. And see, when a person is in the middle of a situation, usually the situation looks a lot bigger than it really is. And sometimes it looks big because it is big. And that's exactly what happened here. They're told they're going to win but it looks like they're going to lose. They were told that they're stronger, but the people are bigger. God, you said I'm stronger, but they are bigger. You said I'm going to win, but they look like winners. You said there's more of us, but when I count, there's a whole lot more of them. And what happened is because they looked with their eyes... They turned around in disbelief. They were overwhelmed by the crisis that was in front of them. And you know what the end result was? They didn't go into the land of Canaan. Everyone in that generation died. The only two people who made it in was Joshua 
and Caleb. Now, you might be saying, what does that mean? It's very important that you understand what it means. Here's what it means. It means you can follow God your whole life and miss success. You can get to heaven but miss earthly prosperity. That means that the same two people in church can follow God and both start off at the same place, but one of them makes it and the other suffers. Why? Because serving God is not easy. It's not for the wimps. You gotta be tough. It's, it's, it, it requires some grit. It requires us to look at life and say, man, I'm scared. But I won't let fear paralyze me. He told me I can win, so I'm going to try. See, and I don't know what situation you're in the middle of right now, but I guarantee you it probably looks bigger than God. Look, let's not over-spiritualize it. I'll be the first to tell you there's been situations in my life, even over the last few years, and, and, it, and it was overwhelming, and it looked a whole lot bigger than God. And when we're in the middle of this and we're looking at this giant, whatever that crisis is in your life, it's important for us to say, Lord, give me your eyes. See, Caleb remembered that he was promised victory. And when you're in the middle of your crisis, you need to remember that God's promised you victory. In Numbers 1, excuse me, Numbers 13 and 1, in closing, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and said, Send the spies out to the land of Canaan, which I am giving you. So they were already told that they're going to get the land. But for some reason, they allow what they saw to get in the way. You, you know, I, look, look. There's a lot of times in my life that I allow things that I see get in my way. And I got to go home and sit and process and pray and say, Lord, I hate the way I feel. I hate the anxiety I have. I'm overwhelmed. I, I feel like I'm about to lose it. I want to call it quits. And God will tell me things like, be of good courage. Or God will remind me that I'm a victor and not a victim. God will remind me that it looks like they're bigger than you, but, God, but remember, your God is bigger than them. And the only thing that I do is keep moving forward. I don't know what to do. I don't have all the answers, but I just keep moving forward and looking to God, and I refuse to be a victim. I want to talk to you today who's in a crisis troubles in your life, whatever it is. Maybe it's not drugs or alcohol. Maybe it's with work. Maybe it's your company. Maybe it's your mental health. Maybe it's your health. I want to pray that you'll be a victor and not a victim. That your eyes will be opened and you will begin to see your situation differently. The purpose of week one of our series is to build hope in you. I pray that everyone here, that hope has been stirred in you. That faith has been stirred in you. That everyone here on the bottom, up top, that every person here is leaving and saying, you know what, I need to start seeing life differently. You know, I'm looking for somebody up top who can raise their hand and say, yes, I'm ready to start seeing life differently. Come on, you're, you're a victor, not a victim. Amen. You are victors, not victims. You are victors, not victims. I will stop seeing my life like it's over. I will walk in fullness. I will overcome. I am an overcomer. 
I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. God is the I am. And if he's the I am, I'm an I am, not an I was. We're not going to say I was this, I was that, my life was going good. No, 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 no. If I serve a current God and I'm a son or daughter of God, then I am currently living in his blessings. His blessings aren't the old days. He wants to bless you today and tomorrow and the next day. God wants goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life. God wants you to be blessed in your 20s and blessed in your 30s and blessed in your 40s and 50s and 60s. I got some seniors in here who feels like life is over and I pray that God's going to raise you up again because your life ain't over yet and it's time for us to live. I will live and not die. I will live and not die. I will live and not die. I'm an I am and not an I was. I'll be blessed today and not in my past alone. Stir up hope in us, God. Stir up hope. I pray for every discouraged person that you are encouraged today in Jesus' name. I pray for every person who's dealt with hopelessness. I pray that God is putting hope in you. I pray for every person who's tired. I prophesy that God's given you a second wind in the name of Jesus. I prophesy healing. I I declare healing over your body. I declare healing over your mental health. I declare restoration over your family. I declare reconciliation. I pray your children will come home. God is not a man that he will lie to you. He loves you. He loves you. And he wants to bless you. Ask him for forgiveness and you are forgiven no longer to be held against you. He throws it in the sea of forgetfulness. As far as as from the east is the west, so God forgives you and forgets your sin. You are now redeemed and, and whole, and he wants to bless you. Open our eyes, God. Open our eyes, God. Forgive us for being negative. Just say it. Forgive me for being negative. Forgive me for being a victim. Forgive me for blaming it on everybody else. Forgive me for believing the lie. God, help me to know that you're bigger than any giant that I'm facing. When I'm tired, God, help me to keep going. Just tell him in your own words. Just tell him, just say, God, please, I need you to open my eyes. I'm tired of being negative. I'm tired of being pessimistic. I'm tired of it, Lord, and I need something to change in my life. Open my eyes. Father, you are a good father. And your word says that whatever we ask in your name that's according to your will, you will give us. And if an earthly father knows how to give good good gifts to his children, how much more will you give good gifts to those who ask you? Look, look, they're not asking for a lot, God. They're just asking you to open their eyes. And I pray that eyes are being opened all over this building right now. I pray eyes are being opened all over this building. You're going to leave here and the sun is going to shine different. You're going to leave here and you're going to be more positive than you've maybe been in your entire life. I pray when we leave here, faith is stirring up in you. And that that negative spirit is dead. And that spirit of faith is rising. Father, we love you and we thank you. 
there's anyone here that says, I want to receive Jesus, these altars are open. We'd love to pray for you. Maybe you're here today and you say, yeah, I received that prayer, but I'd like an additional prayer. We would love to pray for you. These altars are open. We'll have some elders, some of our prayer team here. We would love to pray for you. Before you leave, we're so thankful you came today. If you were blessed, please do your friends, your family, your co-workers a favor and take one of these and hand them out. Take five, take 10, take 50. Help us to share what God is doing in this building with people in our communities. God bless you. Again, if there's anything you need, we're here for you. Come on, these altars are open. Let's worship together as we close. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Come on.
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you were touched by the message. If you have a prayer need or would like to know Jesus, please put your prayer request in the comments section and someone will connect with you. If you've been impacted by this ministry and would like to support us with your giving, you can do so online or by texting the word INVEST to 22383. We'd also like for you to join us next week right here in the building. It's so special being able to worship together in the same room. In any case, no matter where you choose to worship, we hope that you join us. Same time, same place. Have a blessed week.